<laughs> preserve the illusion. Okay, it's six o'clock. Let's go ahead and kick things off. Uh, try to start and stop on time, as it were. Uh, welcome to The Filter. Uh, my name's Rick Shreves. I'm with Coin Academy. I'm hosting this week as a guest host. Our regular uh, Master of Ceremonies, Gary Dykstra, is off on a well-deserved they're due holiday uh, to Vanuatu, of all places, uh, where he swears there is no electricity or internet connection. But, you know, I was looking at photos of Vanuatu online the other day, and it looks, you know, pretty posh and comfortable to me. I think it's an excuse to just blow us off for a month. So, whatever, he's earned it. So, uh, we're going to just say, enjoy yourself, Gary. You know, we'll deal with it. You know he's all boxed out, too. You know it. You know it, right? I mean, uh, I hear all these things about he's going there to work on a Bitcoin economy, but, you know, I don't know about that. Uh, okay, we are going to see if we can't get this Google Hangout action going. Oh, now that's cool. Now we should do that all the time. <laughs> There's a solution for that that looks like this. Uh, here we are. This is the filter. This is the filter number 56. Uh, the title of this one, When Worlds Collide. Uh, basically, the idea behind that title is we're going to be looking at some collisions that are happening between the new world of digital currencies and traditional economies around the world. We're going to follow our usual format, that is, we're going to go through a, a news roundup uh, and we're going to look at the numbers before we do that, and then we're going to invite group discussion along the way. Uh, for those of you who are new to the filter, uh, this is a byproduct of a group called Bitcoins in Bali. You can follow us on Facebook, here's the page. Uh, the live filter sessions happen in Bali, so if you happen to be in Bali on a Tuesday night, drop by and join us. Otherwise, catch us on Google Hangouts. Uh, the Google Hangouts go directly over to YouTube at the end of every session as well, so you can follow us there. Uh, this last week on the Bitcoins in Bali page, we had quite a bit of action, quite a few posts. We also had a, a bit of a survey up asking people what they found to be of use, and, and, and honestly, I put that up in, in hopes of getting some guidance about whether we should be changing our format. And it looks to me like we're fairly spot on. I mean, the, the vast majority of people found the news recap and the group discussion to be the big issue, so we're going to stick with that. Uh, one quick reminder for everybody, uh, Coin Academy, together with CoinGecko, BitGo, and the Digital Currency Council, are doing a survey right now tracking digital currency adoption. Also doing things like uh, testing market sentiment and market awareness of digi different digital currency brands. As part of the research for that, we've put together a survey. If you jump in and take that survey, we'll send you an advanced copy of the paper. You'll get it before anybody else does. Uh, it's a short survey. It says 20 questions. The reality is there's 21, but, you know, hey, <laughs> just because we're involved with digital currency doesn't mean we count very well. Um, but still, please, take the survey and help us spread the word. Uh, we've got 200-plus participants at this point in time. We'd really like to jack those numbers up so that we have a representative sample and we can draw some good conclusions on that. So your help's really appreciated. Also, uh, I need to put in a plug here for our sponsors, uh, Hubud. We do the filter at the facilities at Hubud, which is a beautiful co-working space located in downtown Ubud, Bali. Uh, drop by if you are in Bali, you will be impressed. It's really a lovely place. Uh, great facilities and extremely reasonable prices for those of you who are looking for someplace comfy to get some work done while you're in Bali. I'm with Coin Academy. So check out coinacademy.co to learn more, learn more about digital currencies. And just by way of quick promotion, uh, this last week uh, Gary set up a dedicated Twitter channel for the filter. It's called the Filter Live. So uh, if you could please follow the Filter Live on Twitter. Also at the same time, he set up a Google Plus page for the filter, just trying to get things sort of segregated for the filter as the filter seems to be growing and growing. Please join us, put the filter in your Google Plus circles. And one final item, we're now on YouTube, so there's a dedicated place you can go to see the videos of the filter sessions and also some other videos that Gary's put together as part of the Bitcoin 101 series, including how to use Fiverr in Bitcoin, how to buy Rupia with Bitcoin, how to withdraw Bitcoin from uh, the local exchange, bitcoin.co.id. Uh, so there's an increasing number of resources up on that YouTube channel definitely places for you to drop by and learn more and do things outside of these sessions. Okay, let's start by looking at the numbers. So where are we right now? Well, in Rupia, uh, the Bitcoin at this moment is sitting at 3,828,000 Rupia to the Bitcoin. 
uh, trading within a fairly narrow range uh, between 849 and 811. Uh, 24 hour volume is actually quite good, 172.3. Uh, now let's put that in the currency most people are familiar with. What are we at in US dollars? $282.66. Uh, again, a fairly narrow range. The high today was 283, the low today was 280. Um, if you look at the chart across this last week since we had our last session, you can see we are down a bit. Uh, don't forget as well, Gary just spent the month of July living off Bitcoin, right? Uh, during the course of that month, I was talking to him today, he said uh, Bitcoin appreciated about 8%. So in the course of living on Bitcoin during the month of July, he was able to actually benefit a bit from a premium. Then again, that could have easily swung the other way. Uh, different ways to insulate yourself from that risk, but not a ton of movement uh, in the last week, though we have continued to see some downside action that most people I think is attributing to uh, everyone calming down a bit over Greece. Uh, there was also some speculation that the Chinese market was driving things, but some of that pressure seems to have come off a little bit as well. So uh, that's where we are. Now let's look at a couple of other numbers. Let's look at volatility. There is a site that measures Bitcoin volatility. They produce a Bitcoin volatility index uh, it is an estimate. It's an estimate taken across a 30-day period. It's, it's actually quite interesting. And really, the, to put this into context, let, let's skip down here and look for a second at this. In terms of comparison, the volatility of gold averages around 1.2%. Other major currencies average between 0.5% and 1%. So where does Bitcoin stand in comparison? Well, right now, about 2.55%, significantly more volatile than either gold or traditional currencies. That's the bad news. The good news is, if you look at this historically, you can see that with the exception of this spike at the end of January of this year, uh, Bitcoin has managed to stay under 5% volatility since May of 2014. So we have, during this period, this window, seen a significant improvement in volatility, a significant decrease in volatility, uh, even getting down as low as 1% in early June the sort of numbers that we would expect to see from a fiat currency. So there is hope. Uh, it's, everyone says the volatility of Bitcoin is actually one of the main, uh, particularly for merchants who are trying to, to avoid taking uh, unpredictable losses on holding Bitcoin. So the less volatility, the better. Things do seem to be trending in the right direction. A couple of other numbers to look at. We don't look at Bitcoin network data in here very often, but I kind of thought it's interesting to do. Um, what are the total blocks at this point? 368,347. The total bitcoins, it's a number we look at quite often. Now seeing over 14 million, approaching 14.5 million. Here's a number you don't see very often. What's the current reward for mining a block of bitcoin as a miner? Well, it's actually 12.5 XBT, in other words, $3,500. So every time a mining operation completes a block, that's what they get paid as the reward. When did it have? Was that really recently? When was the last having, guys? It's been, I don't think it was a year ago. It was about a year. Yeah, it's been quite a while now. Oh, yeah. You said that the block reward, is that including fees? Yeah. Uh, that does not include yeah. fees. That's the reward in Bitcoin. Right? What are they paid for completing that block successfully? Yeah, right. well, I mean, there's a, there's a Coinbase transaction and then fees. Well, that's that's correct, but the fees, the fees aren't always paid, right? Fees are only paid in some situations. It depends on the arrangement with the person who's doing the transaction. Yeah. Some of the exchanges automatically build the fees in, others don't. So whether there's a fee associated with it is going to vary from transaction to transaction. It's, just, um, it's been in the news a lot, so uh, I was kind of curious as to the, you know, whether it, um, whether it's anywhere near that amount or it's tiny or... Honestly, I don't know, but from what I've seen in terms of the amount of fees that I've seen being charged, I would expect it's actually quite tiny, right? But then it's going to depend upon the size of the block that's being completed, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, in the last 24 hours, you know, what sort of numbers are we looking at here? 157 blocks in the last 24 hours, an average of six blocks per hour. So, you know, there's some serious money turning over in mining operations is the bottom line. Average time to mine a block in the last 24 hours, right at that nine minute number, a little better than the 10 minutes that we're used to seeing. <coughs> Excuse me. 
average transactions per hour right now, 5,307. Now, if we look at this another way, we can drill down a little bit. Take a look at the average daily number of transactions across the last month. You can see that within the last couple of days, the number of daily transactions is actually down quite a bit. Where's the big spike? The big spike is right back here, July 12th, 208,759 transactions. That coincides with right there. July 12th is when uh, the other shoe dropped. And then you can see right after that, the numbers came right off those averages. How does this compare looking at a longer time span? Still, if you look at the last three months, the entire Greek situation was the big spike in daily transactions. Going back to the year, again, the Greek action was huge. And you can see how much this has trailed off. If we look at this in terms of a trend, though, you can see that the number of Bitcoin transactions is trending positive across the last year. More and more life in the ecosystem is what that means, and that's a good thing. What are the average number of transactions per block? Again, this would relate to how much of a reward is earned by the, the, the miners when they complete a block. Well, in the last few days, it's been around 700, 680 to 760. Back <laughs> July 12, when everything was going crazy, average number of transactions, 1,546. Huge number of transactions to be completed in the block. OK, another number that I wanted to take a look at, and this is one that we haven't looked at before, is Bitcoin venture capital activity. Uh, there is quite a bit of happening, as we saw last week, or maybe it was the week before that. Uh, Bitcoin and digital currencies were one of the fastest growing areas for venture capital investment. Well, who's making investments and where is it going? Coindesk maintains a list of these venture capital investments. Uh, it's a little odd, they say it was updated 10 July, but they record transactions as recently as the 21st, so I don't think that's correct. The well, last one was July 21st, Bidix picked up a $4 million round. Uh, before that, July the 9th, a mining company picked up one of the largest rounds on its chart, $20 million. And you can take a look at this and see the sort of things that are getting investment money. Mining, financial services, a payment processor, a wallet, a whole bunch of financial services systems, a couple of exchanges, including ItBit out of Singapore, Singapore and New York, technically. Uh, and again, more financial services, uh, some mining investment, which I think is quite interesting and actually surprises me a bit. And the other thing that I thought was quite interesting here is when I went over and I looked at the investors and I started looking for a pattern, who comes up again and again? It's these guys, RRE Ventures. They turn out to be by far the most active of this whole group and have invested in a number of different projects primarily in financial services in the course of the last few months. So who the heck is RRE Ventures that is throwing millions of dollars at the Bitcoin space? Well, they claim to be New York's most active venture capital firm. Uh, they do have a history of, uh, of investing in a wide variety of projects, including simple things like Bitly. They have invested in Ripple in the past, uh, Quirky. Uh, all sorts of things. They're really sort of all over the place, if you will. There are a lot more than simply uh, financial services involved here in their investment strategy. So they're sort of a broad-based investment group. Uh, if you take a look at who's on the team, you'll see there are some named players here, uh, particularly when we scroll down to uh, their advisory board. Bobby yeah, Bobby F. Uh -huh. On the internet, no one can tell you're a dog unless they put your photo on the about page. Um, there's Sam Nunn, uh, Daniel Stern. Um, who else do I see on here? Oh, Shelly Lazarus. Uh, you know, there are some names on this involved in this firm. So this is one of our big players in the digital currency investment space. Uh, there are some other names that you'll recognize if you go through this, this list. Uh, Andreessen Horowitz. Um, who else did I see on here that, that really jumped out at me? Uh, Route 66 Ventures has several investments on this list as well. I don't know anything about them. Uh, Draper's got investments here. Goldman Sachs is in here. Uh, it's definitely worth a look if you are interested in what's happening with this space and where the big money is going or if you're looking at starting a, a digital currency Bitcoin venture and you wonder who's getting funded, it's a good way to look at things.
there's one in the top area. Yeah, what's that? In our friends of BitX. Yeah. BitX have a tie to South Africa. That's correct. Yeah. And they made a bucket load of money involved in WeChat in China. So that's a very interesting move, I think, from investors to start dipping their toe into the water, especially with the exposure in the China space and the reach that WeChat has is phenomenal. So mm -hmm. Do you know? And in Indonesia, BitX is in Indonesia. Yeah. Does uh, was this NASPER's first investment in uh, the digital currency sure. space? I'm not sure. I've just having recently been in South Africa and hearing a bit about what NASPER is up to. Um, it's just interesting to see that pop up in BitX. Okay. Yeah, you can see the list of uh, of you know where these companies are based over here on the right. And what region they're in, uh, BitX being the big player in Asia here, a lot of US and Canada action. Here's another Asian player here based in Makati, Philippines. And who is that? That is Satoshi Citadel Industries. Wow, frankly, an organization I know nothing about. Something to look up. That's 100 grand? Yeah, 100 grand. Uh, Tokyo. Uh, an exchange, Bitflyer. And another in Japan here. Another exchange. Oh, Bitflyer picking up a second round. But now we're all the way back in October 2014. Uh, so the amount of activity by far is, is taking place in North America. No surprise there, I suppose. Uh, but it's good to see there is some uh, increasing awareness in Asia. In fact, we'll look at another news item later on about some new activity in Asia. All right. That's the wrap-up of By the Numbers. Uh, I wanted to show this chart. Gary is, is always showing us uh, the list of, of vendors uh, and where they're located in our region. But I thought it was kind of interesting to take a look at uh, what's the situation with ATMs in the region, Bitcoin ATMs. Because, you know, we've, as you all know, we've got one sitting right up there in the lobby. How many more are there? Let's zoom in a bit. Uh, if you zoom in a bit, you see that uh, in, in our little corner of the world, if we define this as Southeast Asia, um, you know, Bali, <laughs> there aren't a whole lot of other Bitcoin ATMs in the region. Yeah. We've got some action up here in Manila. We've got action in Bangkok. Uh, that looks like uh, someplace near Penang. Is this is Kuala Lumpur, and this is Singapore. Yeah, it's in Penang, if we zoom in there a bit. Now, obviously, there's going to be probably a few more pins in Singapore when we zoom right in there, but you can see with Bali, there's two pins emerging, which would be here and, I guess, Oscar's place in Kuta. Those would be the two here. Uh, but you see, that's the only action in Indonesia. And then if we zoom in on Singapore, Singapore has a whole cluster of pins. So if you're looking to travel about using Bitcoin and you want to know where you can go with ATMs, well, there's your list. Penang, Kuala Lumpur, Singapore, Manila, Bangkok. That's about it. Wow. Real concentration in the financial district in Singapore. Is it just really look like there's nothing in Vietnam? I saw nothing in Vietnam, but let's... Again, let's Possibly because, yeah, there may be a regulatory complication that doesn't allow ATMs to, independent ATMs to operate. You know, it is technically a communist nation. Uh, it's probably heavily regulated financial services, I would expect would be. Hong Kong's got a couple, expanding, expanding our view a little bit. Uh, Taiwan, Shanghai, Korea, Tokyo, and of course, Beijing. We have as many here as we can do in Japan. Uh, well, unless we zoom in, it's kind of hard to say. But yeah, I don't see... Oh, yeah. oh, there's a few. There's a few blooming in Tokyo, but come on, it looks like there's one in Osaka. Nothing in in Kyoto, Nagoya. Uh, it really, is kind of surprising, isn't it? Got more in Bali than they do in all of Africa. Mm -hmm. And there's more in Singapore than there are in Tokyo. In fact, it looks like there's more in Singapore than there are in Japan. Collect. Bit of a surprise. Um, the last few charts that we looked at, these are all located on CoinDesk. 
uh, there's a nice price and data section on CoinDesk where all this information is located. Um, it's really quite useful. It's, it's kind of fun to explore and see what's happening. Okay, let's take a look at the news. Oh, heck, one more slide, coin market cap, sorry. Mm -hmm. See, I'm new at this, right? Can you tell? Uh, what's happened with, uh, with the position of the currencies relative to each other in terms of market cap? The short answer is extremely little for the top five or six. It's stayed exactly the same. There's been no change across the last couple of weeks. Uh, Ripple saw a big spike that's now trailed off. Uh, I would have to pull up the exact date on that. Uh, Litecoin, again, uh, really sort of following the Bitcoin path. No real surprises there. Uh, Dash, Dogecoin, the same thing. Uh, each of those currencies seem to uh, sort of act as sort of a multiplier off whatever's happening on Bitcoin. Uh, does anybody know anything about banks' shares? I mean, these guys show up as number six in the market cap, but, uh, for example, we've included them in the survey, and absolutely nobody seems to know who these guys are. If I stand in Hong Kong, um, there's some, uh, I'm over the top of my head, but there's some kind of back by some rich guy out of London, young guy, and, uh, um, they're currently operating on the it shares platform, it shares the two of options. They've actually just sent out an advisory of some of their stuff that they're doing um, on, over the weekend. They, they're a whole heap of different things, right? Like they're involved in uh, the equity type stuff. The, I don't know what this bank shares coin actually does. I'm going to look at Did it. they pre mine? Is that why this market cap is so large? I don't know. Yeah. yeah. I think they got a startup there, which is usually. This this yeah. story here. Ah, okay, okay, <clears throat> okay. So just looking at market cap, there we go. Now news roundup. Dun dun dun. And of course, the big news of the week that everybody's been excited about is you know the other shoe has dropped, as it were. The Mt. Gox founder has been arrested. Um, you know, this was one of those things where a lot of people were wondering whether this was going to happen, and I think for a lot of people, the question was simply, when is this going to happen? Um, you know, the story that it was hacked always seemed to have a lot of holes. Um, there was always discussion that it might have been an inside job. Well, finally, the Japanese regulators, the Japanese prosecutor, felt they had enough information to make an arrest, and they did it. What turned out to be really damning here was after the arrest, a gentleman by the name of Ashley Barr, a former employee at Mt. Gox, and he claims he was actually asked to become the Mt. Gox CEO, um, though this hasn't been confirmed, he went on Reddit and he claimed credit for helping the Japanese police to arrest Carpels. All right, why? And this is really fairly damning. Uh, he said he had a conversation with uh, the uh, founder. And he stated the expenditures far exceeded every model we had for income. I confronted Mark about it, told him I couldn't take the role, that's the CEO role, CEO role if he couldn't explain this gross incompetence in spending. He was also asking other employees than myself to find investors, something that was impossible without knowing the financial status of the company. And here's the really bad part. Mark only had one bank account shared with the Mt. Gox customer deposits. As he says, that was the nail in the coffin. Yeah, yeah, that would be the nail in the coffin. Uh, you know, in the West, at least, or I shouldn't say in the West, I should say in any other properly regulated financial environment, commingling funds, right, is absolutely against all gap principles and is subject to prosecution in these environments. You can't commingle personal funds with corporate funds. You can't commingle personal or corporate funds with client funds. It all has to be segregated and Chinese walled out. Um, it appears that Mt. Gox violated that very fundamental principle. You know, maybe it's a case of just growing too fast, uh, not being aware of what he really needed to do. I don't know what the situation is, but let's face it, ignorance really is not an excuse in this situation. Um, and a lot of money went away. Now, to uh, even things out, let's hear Harple's side of the story. He states, he has admitted to tweaking the amount of a Bitcoin account to, quote, the range of several thousand yen or several tens of thousands of yen, unquote, but said this was just to test the computer system. 
Ooh, that, uh, that defense keeps getting thinner and thinner and thinner, doesn't it? Um, you know, the real sad part here for those who are looking for justice, if you will, or how you define justice, uh, the penalties that he's actually susceptible to as the charges are presently formulated are amount to no more than really a slap on the wrist. I think he's facing either a couple of years in jail or like a $4,000 fine, seriously. Because, and this is the time to do it if you're going to break the law, there was no law governing what he was doing at the time. Therefore, they're having problems finding what exactly they can prosecute him under. Uh, so I'm sure the prosecutor is going to get clever and we're going to see, you know, fraud and all sorts of other things come up. But at this point in time, it looks like, uh, you know, they are serious about prosecuting, but honestly, they don't have much to go on to uh, sustain a significant penalty. What are the charges, though? Like, is he being accused of embezzling more than money? Or is he just being accused of just being incompetent and then someone's been able to expose the system for embezzlement? He was arrested on embezzlement and, quote, illegal manipulation of accounting. On accounting, that's exactly what accounting is. <laughs> <laughs> so it actually is on embezzlement. So presumably that's got pretty steep penalties. Yes, uh, theoretically. But uh, what I'm seeing so far, at least what they've outlined so far, is that uh, it is not scary numbers for him. But again, you know, we're going to have to wait until we find out more. And, and God knows I know extremely little about Japanese law, uh, and that is what he's being prosecuted under. So I don't know. I don't know. Um, did, when did it all happen? Did he get his passport taken off him? Well, I was just about to say, I would hope they did. Otherwise, I have real trouble understanding why he'd be silly enough to still be in Japan. Exactly. <laughs> so if he was still in Japan and he had the right to be able to leave, then you'd have to think. It maintained it all along that there was nothing wrong. Yeah. I mean, the, the internet seems to disagree. Yeah, but I mean, you know, if, if you had one bank account with your personal funds and your client funds, by definition, you've done something wrong in any sure. financial that's, that's regulation environment. Gross incompetence at the least, yes. Yeah, that's, yes. So that's one guy getting on Reddit. You've got a question what his motive is as well. Like, why all of a sudden did he just jump on Reddit and exploded everything out? Well, I would assume, and I, and I am assuming, that uh, you know, once the arrest was made, he felt he could speak, right? Uh, and you know, he he named his name. He is listed as a former employee on his LinkedIn profile. I mean, he uh, you know, he's not hiding behind a pseudonym. Um, so you know, we'll see what happens. But you've also, I don't know, you kind of think the incoming out of the stuff hinders um, couples uh, like right? So typically it would actually hinder more of the prosecution than it would the defense, right? So yeah. coming out and doing that, you assume that it's helped the prosecutors get this kind of arrest. Yeah. So it just, it, it just stinks to me. Yeah, well, the whole thing does. There's yeah. no doubt about that. I mean, it's not getting any less elegant. No, it's not getting any more elegant. There's, there's just no way it is. Especially with a hat like that. Yeah. <laughs> it's very not elegant. <laughs> Okay, so that was really the big news item of the week. I also thought this was one of the big news items of the week, and I wanted to touch on it. Ethereum launched their decentralized app network, a release they're calling the Frontier release. Now, this is interesting for a couple of reasons. First, this is 18 months and roughly $18 million after it was first announced, okay? It is not... A public release it is as they say a bare-bones command line format release aimed at developers now it's basically a live testing environment the good news is is that you actually can use it to create assets and to peg them against the blockchain or to use the blockchain to register and manage those assets so it actually is a usable tool uh, and they say that when it goes to the next release, uh, whose name I, I don't know, They've, they have said what the name is, that you will still retain the validity of things that were created during the Frontier release. In other words, you can build on, on it now without fear of, of losing it when the next release comes out. But the problem is, I mean, it really is bare bones command line. It's, it's quite minimal for something that's taken 18 months and $18 million. Um, Check out this timeline here. It says, following the creation of the Ethereum Genesis block, which contains all the transactions from the crowd sale, users are now able 
the native token called Ether. Unlike Bitcoin, Ether is not intended to be used as a global digital currency. Rather, it's to perform any action on the network, users need to pay an amount of Ether. Those who validate transactions on the network, as with Bitcoin, will be rewarded in Ether for any resources they contribute via mining. In essence, it's a large pay-as-you-go computer. With Ether, that is computational power, the currency to bring these computerized functions to life. The more you need the computer to do, the higher the fee. So it is a platform. It isn't so much currency. So those market cap numbers that we look at, they really aren't terribly, terribly relevant to this. This is not a Bitcoin. You know, this is not a Litecoin. It is a different manner. It's more akin to NXT. Now, does it have huge potential? Well, it was created by a really bright guy. You know, Vitalik Buterin is, is the brightest guy in the room most any place he goes. Does that mean he can run a great company? Well, that's pretty much up in the air at this point in time. Notice what they state here. The glut of 2.0 platforms such as Factum and Counterparty often function by running abstraction layers on top of the Bitcoin. Ethereum made the decision to create a purpose-built platform for these functions from scratch, building their own programming language, their own comm system, their own peer-to-peer -peer file sharing network, and a browser for Ethereum apps. It is, in other words, a separate ecosystem. Is it going to be adopted? Well, releasing this developer release is a big step towards getting some attention for it, but here's the scary part. Someone leaked a project chat from May. The Ethereum team member, Matt Liston. In May, Matt states, ETH dev needs years plus. In other words, he says the project needs years more of development. The emails also so the crowd sale is used up and can only sustain the Ethereum development team for another seven months at best. And here's the quote, you know, they ask how many months does ETH dev have at the current burn? And the answer, seven months optimistically. That was in May which is three months ago. So, like to see the accounting on that. Yeah, so there has been a release. Uh, I think it's sort of underwhelming everybody in terms of the functionality the release brings. And at the same time there's been a release, there's also been this revelation that, hey, you know, we're still a long way from having viable products, at least according to one person on the team. I'm not trying to be all doom and gloom about Ethereum. I mean, you know, this is reported in Cointelegraph. There's a lot of people chatting about this right now. Uh, and again, Vitalik Buterin is a very, very bright guy. I certainly don't underestimate him. But uh, what's happening with the organization? If I was an Ether buyer at this point in time, I would probably be wanting to ask some questions, and I would be expecting a little more transparency than I'm getting from the project at this point. Okay. Also in the news, I mentioned that there was some action in Asia. Here it is. Singapore-based Bitcoin brokerage Coin Republic was acquired by Mexico's me, BXT, I guess they're called. Uh, actually, I think it's MexBT, right? Yeah, MexBT, that's a typo in their headline. Nice, thank you, Deal Street Asia. <laughs> On the headline, no less. Um, so, what is Coin Republic? Uh, it's a brokerage, Bitcoin brokerage. They've been acquired by a Mexican brokerage. Um, the Mexican firm MexBits out to increase their market share and have a foundation for establishing payment solutions using blockchain technology between Asia and Mexico. Financial details not disclosed. It looks like uh, they're maintaining the team, uh, David Moskowitz and company over at Coin Republic, um, and they seem to be quite bullish on, on moving into the region if you read all of this article. Uh, it's good news in the sense that, you know, we are seeing more and more investment activity here, more world global market activity. A lot of people really are, are bullish on Singapore and Hong Kong logically for Bitcoin in the region. What was it? Um, Adam Draper, October 2014, stated, Worldwide adoption is necessary for Bitcoin to succeed, and I believe Singapore is the place for Bitcoin in Asia. We've heard that from a couple of different people, and we've seen several startups, startups launching there. Again, as this article references, BitX raising funds in their Series A round. Again, they're operating from out of Singapore and other places in this region. Uh, and you know, positive developments in our region, which is a great thing to see. Gary posted this one. Uh, it's kind of interesting. 
from a couple of different perspectives. Basically, Overstock, you know, who's moved into the big got a lot of publicity about their activities, has sold a $5 million crypto bond to a New York trading firm. Now, that sounds sort of interesting, but when you actually get into it, you discover really it's almost more of a PR move than it is anything else. As it says here, the sales part of proof of concept from the e-tailer, which shows how financial instruments can be digitized and traded on a cryptographic distributed ledger, such as the Bitcoin blockchain. Um, the CEO purchased a $500,000 crypto bond, and then Overstock said they could sell as much as $25 million in crypto bonds as part of this project. But this first one that they've done, <laughs> they're issuing a $5 million loan to the firm with 3% annual interest, an arrangement that they said would, quote, transfer the economic risk associated with the failure of the technology. In other words, they've gone out and they've sold this bond, but the bond is backed by a loan, which has a guaranteed interest rate against it, meaning that this is a no-risk punt for the firm, other than if it all falls over, they potentially lost the difference the market rate was for their money at that point in time. So like I say, it smacks of more of a PR exercise from Overstock than anything else. Uh, this is, I thought, interesting. Overstock also hinted at the complex regulatory process it expected to encounter when first launching its attempt to build a decentralized stock exchange last year, suggesting the US SEC has not approved the offering. <laughs> so, uh, you know, it might even technically not be an offering at this point in time. It may be a loan with a press release on top of it. You know, it's really kind of what it sounds like. But it's interesting to see, you know, an increasing number of sophisticated financial instruments that are looking to use the blockchain or digital and cryptocurrencies to back them and to <coughs> facilitate their purchase and use. Okay, Greece. We have to talk about Greece, right? I don't know if you saw this one, guys. Just came out. Bank shares collapsed 30% on the first day of trading in five weeks. Now, how bad is that? Well, let's put it this way. 30% is the maximum you can go down before they stop the trading. <laughs> in other words, they maxed out the limits, okay? Now, there's, there's charts in this. This is sort of summary here from the telegraph of the whole situation. And these charts are all just stunningly depressing. For example, <laughs> and if that one's not enough, that, by the way, is their manufacturing output in July. That's not even the stock market number. It's the manufacturing sector. We're taking a holiday. Yeah, exactly. They should take a holiday. Uh, they're talking about changing the retirement age from 67, or from 62 to 67. As they put it at 5 o'clock, bloodbath on the Athens Stock Exchange. Worst trading day in history. Uh, it was off to a 23% fall, but let's, nice chart. But reality is at the end of the day, it only closed down 16.2%. That is the market as a whole, but the banking index was down the maximum. Okay, how about that one? Nice, huh? Now, all of this adds up to a really interesting statistic. Oh, I like that. Puerto Rico, not as bad as Greece. But then again, <laughs> what is right now? Um, here we go. The National Bank of Greece is now worth worth less than its subsidiary in Turkey. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's taking a hit. Again, there we go. What did that trading day look like? Well, we started up there. Scary. So the market did edge up from that 23% fall off when it opened, but it closed down still 16.3%. That is a historically bad day for the market. Um, but the real truth is, you know, the banking sector took the massive hit, the maximum allowable by law. Now, the Greece situation was reported in a couple of different cases. Uh, just to look at it from a different aspect, right, how bad is this Brexit deal? Uh, the New York Times ran an article on where the bailout money goes, uh, and it's nothing short of stunningly depressing. And for every cynic in the room, this will reinforce everything you've ever felt about uh, global financial systems and, and global debt instruments. Looking at the previous assistance packages to Greece, New York Times writes, much of the previous bailout funds have gone to pay off Greek bonds held by private investors and other Eurozone governments rather than stoke growth. 
Within Greece, the money was supposed to help replenish banks' capital, to give them lending to revive the morbid economy. Instead, it set in the bank's coffers as bad debts piled up, and it bought time for Greeks and foreign investors to get their money out. Nearly 90% would go towards debts, interest, and supporting the failing banks, as opposed to promoting growth. So what kind of a bailout is that? It isn't a bailout. It's simply a payout for all of the people that lent the money in the first place. Closing line here, the punchline, growth was never the primary consideration when Greece first started receiving bailouts. It was simply, you know, robbing Peter to pay Paul, if you will. Isn't Peter paying Peter? Yeah. Like, I, I thought Paul was paying Paul. <laughs> I'm so confused. What is the point? <laughs> well, you know, I watched uh, Confessions of an Economic Hitman for the first time just recently. Uh, a genuinely poorly made film about, you know, an actually very interesting book. Uh, and, you know, the Greek situation reflects just perfectly the, the entire uh, modus operandi of the economic hitman, right? You go in, you, you, you saddle a country, country with a large number of debts and obligations that basically keep them under control. And we've heard Gary talk about this time and time again. Uh, and the Greece situation is really playing out exactly like that. Like I say, if you're a cynic, the Greece situation currently is really not uh, doing anything to relieve the cynicism. If you're a cynical organized force, though, that was something that happens with the US population by student debt. I agree with you 100% on that. I'm actually going to skip this next one in the, in the name of time, and I'm going to go to looking at Bitcoin prices and how they were impacted after the Greek bailout. Remember the charts we saw earlier about uh, the number of transactions and the block sizes? Well, basically, after this bailout, we have seen, we saw the price spike up to 310. And then it's dropped steadily since then as the heat has come off a little bit. Um, you know, there is supposedly a correlation to that at work here. Uh, we haven't seen as much drive coming off the China market if we look at these two things in terms of time. But it definitely seems to have some momentum from the Greek crisis. Uh, there was a stat. Here we go. According to Bitcoin, see, a data website which offers insight into trading volumes of the major Bitcoin exchanges, the Euro BTC trading volume reached unprecedented levels in the last six months and peaked on 12 July. So for those of us that were trying to pin the, the peak in Bitcoin activity on, is it China and the drop in the China market, or is it what's happening in Greece, these sort of, this sort of statistic that pegs the Euro BTC volume does seem to be the smoking gun in that regard. Speaking of China, the Chinese government jumped in after the market shaved off 8%, dumped in a large amount of capital, have they gotten themselves into a problem? Well, we're about one month into that sharp sell-off and when the first of the series of sharp sell-offs occurred. And the Chinese investors are still looking to the government to stabilize the markets. Now, the China government has a huge, huge war chest that they can use for this, but how long are they gonna be able to maintain this support? Nice article on CNBC on this, the point that they make very simply is this, and it's very, very common sense. The government has now entered the market at super high levels, 30 times price earning ratios on a lot of the stocks that they've been purchasing. That means there's no valid exit strategy for them. They've become long-term shareholders. So unless Beijing allows the market to correct to the fundamentally supported levels, or they wait until the earnings grow enough to support the valuations, they can't stop pumping money in. They've got themselves in, in one of those classic Chinese finger traps, right? You know, they, they, they can't really pull out right now. They've got to wait for the situation to recover or take a huge financial hit. Admittedly, you know, it's a question of how much the government, how much pain the government can withstand, and they've got very, very deep pockets. Like it says here, Beijing may have the resources to support the market, but it does go against their long-term goals. Um, you know, the longer the support programs kept up, the more distorted the market becomes, right? Because it's being artificially inflated and held up. That's the bad news. The good news is, fair to the Chinese about this, like uh, the gentleman from Axis says, Chinese intervention in the markets has been much criticized, but it's actually very little different from that which is done by the G4 countries during the previous panics. 
And good point here, I didn't highlight it. Aside from the obvious irony that quantitative easing across the West has been distorting markets for the last six years, the criticisms look a little harsh, especially if one recognizes that in contrast to the accepted wisdom, China was trying to prevent a bubble, not stoke one up, right? So, you know, hey, perhaps it's not such a bad thing after all, but looking at the numbers, uh, it seems like it is a potential trap for the central government and could take a, a lot of money to get them out of or a lot of patience. But the Chinese are really, really good at patience. <laughs> Puerto Rico, like I said a while ago, hey, Puerto Rico, it's not quite as bad as Greece, but you know what? It's pretty <laughs> ugly. They just defaulted. It just happened. I love this. They had a $58 million bill due on Monday. $28,000. It's like they passed around a hat. <laughs> I mean, that's not even close, guys. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Why even bother? But here's the bad part. And again, for those of you who are from the Confessions of an Economic Hitman Cynicism School, as it says here, this is going to hurt the island's residents, not Wall Street. The debt is mostly owned by ordinary Puerto Ricans, Puerto Ricans through credit unions. And if you scroll down through this article talking about the impacts, here's the really nasty part. Puerto Rico paid all the debts due except the $58 million due to creditors of its public finance corporation. The government is strategically choosing not to pay the PFC debt because the entities that own that debt, credit unions and ordinary Puerto Ricans, have little legal power to fight back in court. The other debt, some of which is owned by Wall Street hedge funds and hence has more legal clout, was paid on Monday. Yeah. I know. Mm -hmm. it's, uh, it's, it's fairly nasty. Uh, how bad is it? Well, by comparison, Puerto Rico has the same amount of outstanding debt as New York, yet its economy is just a fraction of New York's economy. Puerto Rico is billion, New York state economy is worth 1.2 trillion. So, um, you know, $69 billion economy with, um, you know, $58 million in debt due immediately. I think the $70 billion, there we go, that's the number I was looking for, $70 billion in total outstanding debt with a $59 billion economy and an economy that's in recession. Yeah. Again, may not be as bad as Greece, but, you know, it's kind of embarrassing that a, uh, an American not a state, what is it, a protectorate, technically, uh, is defaulting, huh? Yes, it's a territory, okay. It's it's <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right now, it might be a good idea, might, might be a good idea for me to get the hell out. Uh, going, continuing around the world a little bit, uh, the RAND just got hit by a big sell-off. 14-year low against the U.S. dollar on Friday. Uh, this is largely attributed to concerns over the China slowdown because there's evidently quite a few connections between the economies. Uh, I haven't really dug into this one too deeply, uh, but the point they're simply making is that uh, China's deceleration has pushed commodity prices into a free fall, and that's having a real serious impact on economies. So, Mr. Angle, all the commodity price has been smashed. Oil prices. Yeah, as a friend of mine said recently, hey, you know, you can you can buy a 55-gallon drum for 50 bucks now, and it even comes filled with oil. <laughs> One of the things that was posted up on the Bitcoins in Bali group was uh, this article from Coindesk, and it was a consumer survey, uh, admittedly a fairly weak one, but there was quite a bit of discussion about this, so I put it into the discussion today. Uh, basically, the survey found that consumers feel that Bitcoin is more inconvenient than checks. Now, let's let's deal with the downside of this survey first. Number one, U.S. consumers, uh, of that, 18% reported using an alternative payment method such as Apple Pay, Samsung Pay, and Bitcoin within the last year. So only 180 people out of the 1,000 have actually used alternative payment systems and, frankly, are therefore entitled to an opinion. Um, but... Those people, if you look at the chart, here's the survey results. They felt that cash was the most convenient. Well, duh. Uh, followed closely by credit cards, followed by PayPal, which is very, very odd. I mean, I don't, 
I've had trouble paying with PayPal at most restaurants and gas stations. I don't know about you, though I use PayPal a lot. Uh, Retailer-specific gift cards, mobile payments on smartphones or tablets. That actually fared pretty well, which seems to indicate positive things for digital currencies. Uh, gift cards, debit cards. Why in the world did debit cards do so poorly? I mean, uh, I live on debit cards. They're totally painless to use. Prepaid debit cards. And then down here, which ranked as the most inconvenient? Checks followed by Bitcoin. Sorry, what's the region? Uh, it was done in the U.S. Doesn't PayPal have a debit card in the yeah. States? You can get a PayPal credit card. Debit. It's really a debit card. You're correct. Uh, yeah, it's available in the U.S. It might also be available in some other countries. I don't know. But yeah, it does exist. Maybe that's what they mean. Goldman said another survey. Actually, a, a really small survey base against 752 respondents. But this found that 22% of the millennials in the survey have used Bitcoin and intend to use the payment method again. More than half of the respondents, however, suggested they had never used Bitcoin and had no plans to do so in the future. Now, the reason that I posted this, and yes, I'm the guilty party who posted this lame survey, was because I feel Bitcoin does have a usability problem. Uh, it's too difficult for a lot of people to use. Somebody responded quite appropriately that it really isn't a usability problem. It's a, people have troubles getting their head around it. And then in very, very timely fashion comes this article on Cointelegraph. <laughs> people are just too stupid to use Bitcoin right now. <laughs> it's actually a brilliant little piece. It, it's posted because the, the author won a, uh, a contest on Cointelegraph. But... His point, with despite the inflammatory title, isn't that they are too dumb, but it's that they're ignorant of the true nature of money, which is a really good point. Yeah, uh, As he says here, we often hear that Bitcoin-related software is still too kludgy, complicated, and not grandma-friendly, one of the things that I was saying. But he feels, simply put, unless you are a contrarian or a tech-savvy, rebellious teenager, there's little to no incentive for a regular person in the developed world to use Bitcoin compared to the tried and tested method of swiping plastic at the register. From a practical point of view, I think he tends to be right. But from an education point of view, the big point he makes here is most people fail to see inflation as a hidden tax. That they, you know, they lose some of their purchasing power. And Gary had used this stat before, and it was nice to see somebody else reference it. The inflation rate for the past 102 years has been a whopping 2,310.5%. In other words, the dollar has lost more than 98% of its value since 1913, the year the Federal Reserve was established. Coincidentally, point, while it's true that Bitcoin can, often, can offer faster and cheaper transactions, the difference of 1% or 2% is not significant enough for users to ditch their credit card intermediaries who often sweeten the deal by offering reward points, frequent flyer <coughs> miles, etc. And I think as a practical matter, that's largely true for most Joe consumer types. For those who have, you know, the political slant, the uh, ideological orientation, let's say, uh, yeah, of course you can get past that. But uh, let's face it, it's not terribly easy for a lot of people to use. Uh, when I spoke with Gary about his experience living off Bitcoin for um, the last month, for the month of July, uh, he just basically said, hey, look, you know, the good news is you can survive. <laughs> but, you know, the bad news is it's still very difficult in a lot of aspects and that uh, the outlets, the retailers are, are struggling with it simply through lack of familiarity. There's a nice point he makes here at the end concerning the education element. He, the quote is, if anyone says that Bitcoin is based on nothing but thin air, that it cannot be a money, because it has no real history as a genuine commodity. And whether the person saying this is a novice or a highly trained economist, you need to bring up two central points. One, Bitcoin is not a standalone currency, but a unit of accounting attached to an innovative payment network. Two, this network, and therefore Bitcoin, only obtained its market value through real-time testing in a market environment. So for the skeptics out there, hey, look, you need to open your eyes a little just a Bitcoin. It's about the system that is behind this and what the system can do for you. And yes, it has been 
tested. And yes, it does have value because people have found there to be value in the transactional utility of Bitcoin. Is it the easiest thing in the world to use right now? No, it's not. That, however, will improve. A lot of that VC money we're, going, we're seeing going into the Bitcoin space right now has a vested interest in making sure this improves, and it will. That's what I'm saying is the average show on the street. It doesn't solve the problem. What is the point of switching to Bitcoin? There is no problem. Right, it's like, until it's, it solves a problem, then it's going to get taken. I think until it solves an obvious problem, right? Yeah, like an everyday problem. Yeah, exactly. Uh, again, that's the same point the guy was making a while ago. There just isn't enough incentive to get over that one or two percent, right? When you know, hey, I'm getting frequent flyer miles for using my Mastercard, right? Uh, or it's already attached to my bank account. You know, it's already funded. And that's why it's doing so well in, in Argentina because it is an obvious solution there. Yeah, and this is why uh, you see a few of the um, uh, remittances. And that video where it's picking up some traction, like remittances to the Philippines, remittances into Kenya. And a, a beautiful example of something that disrupts the current the, an old school system is in, in Peza. It's uh, the mobile phone system in Tanzania. Basically, it allows people to send money via text message. And then you can go to your local telephone cell and take the money off your phone. So it's provided a banking platform for unbanked people. So when something like that hits in Bitcoin, that's what it's waiting for. That's what all these VC investments around is trying to. Solve They're trying to find that problem, problem, that solution. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The uh, there was one more thing on this on this point from CoinDesk, uh, and it was part of their news summary. Uh, basically, uh, they were pointing us to a uh, a video over on Bloomberg, which was an interview with uh, BTC China's Bobby Lee, in which the commentator basically unloads on him about uh, Bitcoin, which he labeled as a tainted brand. And this is the commentator, not not Bobby Lee. The commentator stated, it's a tainted brand. It doesn't have a leadership. It's been associated with the Mt. Gox bankruptcy. It's been associated with volatility, money laundering, etc. How do you get respectability for it and legitimacy? <laughs> and then he goes on, right? Uh, you know, uh, stability is a problem. You need stability to be for respectability and legitimacy, et cetera, et cetera. And then on the back of this as well, one of the writers at the Huffington Post uh, wrote a piece called Approach Bitcoin with Caution. Uh, in which she stated, Bitcoin, criminals like Bitcoin due to its unregulated and anonymous nature. Well, Bobby had a good response to this, as he simply pointed out, uh, it is, it is, the, the reality is that it's hard to control what people use Bitcoin for, just like it's hard to control what people use cash or the internet for. Yeah. Uh, I saw a lecture with, uh, our, was, I think it was a lunch event with Andreas and Tanopoulos a while back, and uh, somebody was just going off about, oh, well, people are using Bitcoin to buy drugs and people are using Bitcoin to buy weapons. And, you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and, and he says, well, yeah, but they use cash for that, too. He says, you know, Bitcoin wouldn't actually be very useful if you couldn't do that with it, could you? Would it? And, and it's a good point, right? I mean, you know, it's, it's accepted. It has a degree of anonymity. It's just like cash. Nobody's able to trace me when I hand you a dollar bill. Okay. Um, this was posted by someone on the group. I don't know who it was, uh, but boy, it's a real eye-opener. As they stated here, it's not been featured in the popular media, and it's away from the market's eye. But the fact is that Bitcoin mining in China dominates 57% of the blockchain hash rate. Good reasons for it, cheap subsidized electricity, cool climate, yada, yada, yada. Why is this important? Because the 51% problem, right? You control 51% of the computing power. You're able to dictate which of the which way the chain goes. Remember, we had a soft fork July 4th, right? That soft fork that happened July 4th didn't actually clear up until about July the 16th. I was on the Bitcoin Talk forums today trying to actually pin down when that was all brought back into the fold. It took until July 16th. One person on the Bitcoin Talk forum speculated that at one point in time, at the height of that soft fork, 36% of the mining power was mining on the chain that was going to be abandoned. So you see how close we actually came to it going that way. But this is, this is actually interesting because China had bad internet. And the reason for the soft fork was in part due to the fact that the miners didn't want to 
you know, verify every block because their internet was so slow, right? So, I mean, that's part of the problem, the fact that 57% you know, of the, the hash rate doesn't have access to good internet it is a giant, you know, ping point for Bitcoin. It is. Uh, one of the persons on Bitcoin Talk made the observation, and, and you know, it's a great little, it's a great little catchphrase. Um, he said, uh, Bitcoin has become the most centralized of the decentralized currencies. Uh, and the point that he was trying to make was exactly this one, which is now we're in a position where, you know, a special interest group, admittedly a special interest group that is far from being able to speak with a single voice, China, dominates the blockchain hash rate. Uh, you know, could that power be used in a particular fashion? Well, at this point in time, I think it's too fragmented to be a real risk. But, um, you know, when the largest mining pools are in that location, you know, there's going to be a question, you know, there's going to be a time that uh, some guys sit down over beers and go, hey, you know, between the four of us, you know, we've got 52% of the hash rate power. What can we do with this? Um, maybe we need a Kickstarter. We need a Kickstarter to create a nonprofit that, does nothing but mine Bitcoin. There needs to be another solution, is my point. What can they do? They decide to do something. Well, they are, they're able to dictate, right? They're able to manipulate if they so choose because they control the majority of the hashing power. Well, they, what? Yeah. they can, well, for example, when we had the soft fork, part of the reason for the soft fork was there had been a change in policy. To, to something that was related to OpenSSL, if I remember correctly. And everyone was supposed to switch over to the new methodology that, that stepped away from that. A number of people didn't, right? Now, if that had been 51% that didn't switch, well, then the policy change would, in fact, have been rejected, right? Because the, the, the majority, the system would have defaulted to the majority of the miners, right? So they're able to dictate policy, if you will. Um, we're at seven o'clock. I'm not going to jump into the gold. Uh, prices are going to continue to trend downward. Uh, some of them being radical enough to suggest it's going to go all the way to three hundred and fifty dollars an ounce. Um, that's definitely an extreme prediction, but uh, there has been some solid research that says we're way above. Right now, gold is somewhere around eight hundred and twenty-five dollars. We're a little under eleven hundred dollars today. Um, what is this the result of? Well, perhaps uh, the impact of inflation uh, and what impact does this have on the Bitcoin? Well, that's a discussion for another day. Uh, at this point in time, I'm going to uh, wrap it up in terms of our broadcast, assuming I can actually figure out how to do that. Uh, and we are going to say goodbye until next week. Yes, there we go. Hooray. So thank you for attending, and we'll see you next week. Same bat time, same bat channel. Bye-bye.